they have some inherent advantages that others don't. First of all, they have a huge inventory of content that is evergreen. They are bigger than Apple Podcast in a bit more than four years. It's just amazing what they have achieved. And I think it's unlikely that revenues decline. I think it's much more likely that revenues grow. Even if they just grow slowly from here, there's an enormous amount of headroom. Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and I'm here for the Q1 2023 Mastermind Meeting. Together with Hari and Toby, as always, how are you today, gents? Hey, Stig. Hey, Harry. Good to see you guys again. Yeah, good to see you guys. Fantastic. Doing fantastic, Stig. Thank you for inviting us back. Always. Always, Jen. So it's the market has been crazy. I'm supposed to say it's always, but it seems like right now, I mean, after 2022, when we saw that, you know, bear market and then the market has bounced here, at least so far here in 2023, it's... Uh, we do see a lot of volatility right now, so it's so it's very exciting. Um, and you know, perhaps we should just jump right into it and talk about uh, the picks. Uh, Hari, you have Disney and Toby. You have Amgen. Uh, who wants to go first? Flip a coin. <laughs> All right. I can go first. Um, Please do. Yeah. So I think yeah, the market is definitely schizophrenic. Uh, it's like every week the mode is different. So uh, I don't know what, how Disney will be positioned by the time we go on air um, for this episode. But uh, Disney has been my long, long time favorite. I think most of us grew watching Disney uh, characters and so are our kids. And I'm a captive subscriber to Disney Plus. And will be for many years to come till my kids uh, grow out of it. But uh, the reason I'm pitching Disney is uh, it's in a very interesting um, market or ecos ecosystem. And it's playing in that, but it has some inherent advantages. So as uh, Professor Rashwat Damodaran uh, recently on CNBC described that the direct-to-consumer or streaming content business model is fundamentally broken, thanks to Netflix. Uh, they have driven up the cost uh, ex uh, exorbitantly, and hence um, they have kind of, you know, started this uh, war for talent and war for content, and uh, it's almost like all these mega players like... Uh, Apple, Amazon, uh, and Netflix, Disney, and everybody else outbidding each other. So it's good for content creators and might not be as good as for the content aggregators. That might be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I see uh, Disney as like a railroad in this uh, context. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. It's almost like uh, uh, they have some inherent advantages that others don't. First of all, they have a huge inventory of content that is evergreen. Uh, I don't know how many times we can watch House of Cards or any other show, uh, latest show, but I can, I can tell you based on my experience, my daughter can watch the same Disney episodes many, many times and the same movies. I have sat and watched Cinderella with her for more than a dozen times already. And I guess I'll continue to do that. So there are very few other uh, media houses or even the uh, direct-to-consumer streaming businesses like Netflix or Apple that can come up with a evergreen content. It's very rare. And the second thing is the sheer volume of content, both through organic production and through acquisitions of Marvel, Pixar, Fox, they have over time, so it's been like more than 50 years in the making that they have aggregated these contents. And the reason I said I compare it to railroads is because um, if somebody wants to build a new rail railroad today, the cost of acquisition of land is so high that it's almost impossible to 
to create a new track and somehow even for content i'm trying to use the same analogy because disney produced cinderella or whatever the uh, uh, shows they sh- produced back in the day they still run today and uh, on disney plus they you can even see the year of production 1956 or 1949 the cost was really low or insignificant in today's uh, uh, price context but to produce something that can be as successful today will cost much much more and it's almost prohibitive for many players so that's one advantage the second advantage they have is that they have other sources as well to reach to customers one of them is the pay television even though everybody is kind of dunking on it and there is a lot of cable cutting going on but still 60% of us household watch pay television so it's not like it's going to go away tomorrow however i think the more interesting piece they have is their parks and cruises as demonstrated by the public failure of metaverse people still like to go places so and that's also in their uh, quarterly result this time their revenue grew 21% for their parks compared to last year so as soon as the pandemic was over people are rushing to the parks because they want to go there before their kids turn teenagers and don't want to talk to them anymore <laughs> so and and i'm i'm one of them like um as soon as i could i took my kids to disney disneyland in los angeles so um and then they also have a foot in the future with their uh disney plus hulu uh, bundle with espn plus um so they kind of are capturing that market as well i think it's in a nascent stage their losses are reducing for example compared to previous uh quarters their losses is kind of you know steadily declining in fact this time it the loss was better better than expected in the sense lower than expected um and their revenues are steadily growing at 8% but i think for me the reason i am interested in disney at this point of time is one return of bob iger um there was a fundamental cultural shift that was happening which was in the long run not good for disney that is centralizing both the creative and distributive uh, decision making and bob iger is basically returning it back to the original state so that's good for disney and also he's talking about cost restructuring there might be even a spin off of espn because i feel that is their weakest link because one the sports content is not evergreen its shelf life is kind of much less than other content and there is a huge bidding war for these events uh whether it's wwe or any of the games and if disney is able to spin off or sell it off because that's not their core strength anyway um that might be the catalyst for both their um growth in their operating margins as well as profits so there are certain risks as well to the stock for example i feel the biggest risk for them is if they continue to be in businesses that are not their comp- their core strengths like sports espn and they get carried away uh in the bidding wars with netflix and apple and other players and become irrational and the second risk is that their exposure to the general economic weaknesses like you know um whether ads or park visits or subscribers they can all go down when there is economic weakness uh but i think one of the key um things to watch out in case of disney is are they able to still churn out good creative contents i think that is their ip they have a huge uh pool of talent 
and are they able to organically come up with good content that will keep them going otherwise uh or or the long run uh that is what i would be worried about so today their price to earning i'm pretty sure toby will not like it <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> and and knowing you stick i don't i know that i'm actually i'm i'm getting ready for your <laughs> counterpoints on the on those aspects especially with 65 pe ratio but the reason i'm pitching is the pe ratio is based on the current earnings and without significant growth in revenue i'm expecting i'm not expecting more than 6 to 7% revenue growth um for them over the next couple of years for the foreseeable future but what i am expecting is that they will take some measures especially with the encouragement encouragement of activist investors uh who are on who are who have taken major stake in the company they will engage in a uh, significant cost restructuring they have already announced job cuts reduction in non uh, non park um uh expenses and stuff like that so i i expect that to continue and their profits to improve and their earnings to increase and their pe ratio to come down and in the long run as this model of streaming is broken until it is fixed i feel disney has the most uh strongest position actually among the players to come out better uh as they are diversified and they are and they don't need to engage in this bidding war so that's my that's my pitch and i am ready for your questions I like Disney as a business. I like Disney as a company. I think that's a I think that the idea of having IP that appeals to little girls mostly. I mean I I know they have other on Marvel and so on for boys. But uh the little girls get that Disney princess and then they can remember who the Disney princess was, who they sort of attached to and they remain attached to that I think for most of their lives. So it's a it's a powerful connection if they can make it the the question that i have is um given that that is so important I, like if i my my i have a 9 year old daughter who we have disney as well and i i sort of i'm interested in which movies that the kids want to watch because i have 5 year old boy a 7 year old boy and they're not really interested in the disney princess driven movies and so the only way we're going to watch those movies is if my daughter and i want to watch it so i quite like moana i want to watch moana she wants to watch moana but she doesn't connect to moana she connected to elsa but elsa she was a little bit young so she really hasn't had a princess for a little while and she's sort of i think she's sort of sailing through a little bit and they're going to miss her if they don't get a princess for her in there sometime soon so i just wonder you know how important is that to connect with them early on but they have a lot of other content too they have all of the marvel stuff they have pixar or the pixar my kid it's funny i i sort of i'm intensely interested in which of those things my kids connect to and they don't they don't really seem to have connected to any of it really for a little while i think maybe the pandemic stopped some of the production what what do you think about that is that is that is that an issue that anybody discusses or is that totally peculiar to me No I think that's a very good point uh, Toby and and you're absolutely right if they don't keep updating their characters to the current generation there is a there is a significant chance that they will miss on making those connections with them like how they have made with the previous generations and that is the risk I see and that's why I I felt comfortable when Bob Iger came back and he said like you know creativity and profitability that there these are the two key things that he will be focusing on he's like back to creativity i think that gives me comfort my son connects to pixar movies uh, quite a bit like incredibles or cars uh, so um but i i guess it's like each kid has their own preference and that's that's the key that they have to really understand their market segment and i feel 
Disney Plus, more than a revenue generator, I see it as a cost center for them because it is kind of aggregating user feedback and um, user preferences, which they it's very hard for them to do through movie theaters. But this is an amazing um, platform they have, and I'm pretty sure they will have a good analytics team looking at all these things because Netflix has mastered that model. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I was that was that was my next question. To what extent did they need to own something like Disney Plus? But if that if there's a feedback mechanism, that does make a lot of sense. I think in, so, in relation to the content. Sorry. sorry, Stig. Just in relation to the content being evergreen, I my kids don't like, and I think that, that you know f- for us we have stuff that was made in our lifetime. We consider to be you know newish and i think they feel the same way so i try to show them stuff that's just a little bit before their time and they think the animation's too old they don't want to watch it so i've tried i've tried to show like uh you know the very first thing that they made um i'm blanking out a little bit is it alice in wonderland yeah that was one of those like you know earlier ones that's that's like the very first thing they made i went back and watched that with them i thought it was absolutely spectacular for the time when they hand drew all of it i think it's an incredible movie you haven't seen it in like your adult life you should go back and watch it because it's fantastic but for my kids it was just torture they were just like this is too old and i try and i've showed them progressively like stuff all the way up to um probably just before pixar was acquired and they're not interested in any of that stuff. It's sort of like they want that newer looking stuff. Absolutely. I think that that is the key. I guess you brought up an interesting point, Toby. Maybe the content they produced long time back is something the adults watch. <laughs> and, yeah. And the newer stuff is watched by the kids. But I guess, Hari, that, that part is still important. I mean, I... Uh... I gave my my two nieces they're they're eight and and ten a trip to to Disneyland and they they really want to eat a pancake with a princess and it's like 150 bucks per kit I don't know if it's if if pancakes are included <laughs> and so it's like 45 minutes you could get a photo with a princess and apparently there are pancakes too who knows and you're like, and, and you hear yourself saying things like, that sounds like a great idea. And so whenever something like that happens, you just know that there's just something there, right? Like, would I have done the same thing if it wasn't a Disney princess? If it was, I don't know. You said House of Cards. I don't think necessarily think they're directly. Comp- uh, <laughs> I watched House of Cards four times uh, and I, I didn't see any, any Disney princess in there for, for sure. But like, would we do that for our kids? Uh, for for Netflix's franchise, I, I I don't know. There's something there, and you know, this just turned 100 years, and uh, the Economist had like a, a fantastic series of articles about that. And and anyone who's interested in, in investing in Disney, I would, I would highly recommend um, uh, reading those. But I I remember saying a long time ago to a to a, to a friend of mine that whenever Disney hit a, a hundred bucks, I would buy. And what happened was that you know they hit like 86 or something like somewhere in the 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 80s. And I chickened out, you know, as it, as it very often often happens. Uh, partly because whenever something tanks, a lot of other things also tank. Uh, but Disney tanked more than than other stocks for for a number of reasons. So uh, partly we have the the leadership issue. Um, I think the market team that are really excited about getting Bob Iger back and like who who wouldn't? But the the task that he has now are just are just different. Uh, you know, he he's he's. Uh, coming in, he has two years to hand it off, uh, you know. And we we all we all forgotten everything that happened with the Eisner and like the whole, you know, when everything just exploded and like Ayo came in and he saved the day and you know he bought Pixar, he bought Marvel and like those those type of eco projects that just never worked out and they did work out, which is just amazing in itself. And so I, I guess I would be a bit worried about that, like what's what's going to happen. And I guess that's also part of the. Uh, why it's, why it's trading. I think at the time recording is trading at $113. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's relatively cheap. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a wonderful stock. Um, I also want to say like in, in Horace defense, whenever he talked about uh, PE ratios and, and, and so forth. So one of the things that we've, 
uh, that we learned whenever the interest rate was low and everyone just started investing, some with success and, and, and others uh, not so much, was to uh, to have increased focused on normalizing earnings. And I'm I'm saying that because I'm gonna pitch a stock afterwards <laughs> that's going to look ridiculous too. So I'm I'm sort of like doing it to to ask for forgiveness. But uh, you know the streaming services they're they're losing uh, at Disney Plus they're losing a billion dollars um, a quarter. And so it would be outrageous to say that it has no value. Uh, of of course it has value, but like if if you have to you have to normalize earnings if if you want to do that. If you look at where Disney makes their money, so they make slightly more on cable and broadcast channels. Uh, here in 2022, uh, they did like uh, around eight billion dollars um, in uh, in operating income. Uh, in the parks, uh, experience in products are slightly less. And of course, whenever you look back, you have to remember we also had COVID, so the parks experience in pro- products didn't rebound before uh, fiscal year of 2022. And so it it doesn't look as crazy like if you just like take a look at it, you're like, oh my god, that looks ridiculous. It it it, it doesn't look as ridiculous uh, as it, as it might sound like. Um, I, I do agree with you, Hari, that they have a stronger position um, in streaming. Um, I guess my question is, one of the concerns I have is, do you want to compete in that space? You know, it, it, it's, it's one of those where, yes, they are better, but are they like best, uh, one of the better in that terrible in- industry? And I, I don't know about that. Like, um, whenever you look at some of the money money that Amazon is spending right now, and you know, a- Apple have started you know <laughs> with that thing too, and of course you have Netflix. I you know, it's just I mean, one of Netflix production companies reached out to us to create a series about us for crying out loud. That just means they must be pretty desperate. That was sort of like <laughs> that was sort of like my take on it. But you know, it's like. That that type of like volume game and like what what you see happening right now, it just seems to be one of those where they just pressure each other's martins, and, and that's also what you're seeing now. You have this narrative about Disney. And I want to say that Disney probably have more synergies than whenever Netflix are doing not now starting to do their oh come and you know, we have the gaming also. I I guess I see other synergies with uh with Disney than I do see with with Netflix, but it's just a just a tough tough industry uh, that they're in. So I guess that's uh that's my my two cents. Yeah, no, I think great points, uh, Stig, especially the last one that you mentioned is like, do they want to be in the streaming war? And my proposition is actually they can participate peripherally and limit the damage compared to other players. Because the way I think about Disney is they are in the business of creating assets that can be monetized for a long time. It's almost like a pharmaceutical company or a Um, you know, think about it that way. And I think Toby reminded me that they do have an expiry date and like a pharmaceutical company, the, the, the IP goes off after a while. Um, but like, think about every character like that they have created, whether it is Elsa or Moana, um, 10, 12 years after the movie comes in, they're monetizing it in their parks in their merchandising and a lot of other ways, basically. And for for me, it's like, if you think about Disney, they're not really doing anything special for streaming. All they are doing is they're taking their offline content that they would have produced anyway for movies and then digitizing it and putting it on their streaming service. So, like, let's say they didn't have Disney+, Plus, they would still come up with Avatar as a movie. Now you have Avatar special edition making of Avatar on Disney Plus and then finally you will have Avatar at some point on Disney Plus that people can watch as well. So that is the reason I feel they are better positioned in the streaming war. Uh, In fact, they don't have to participate but still benefit. They have these little spin-offs too. My daughter loves uh, The Descendants. Do you know what that show is? It's like the, all of the Disney villains, uh, like Maleficent and so on, they have these yeah. angsty teenage kids who um, get up to shenanigans at high school. And so that's my, my daughter's favorite show. So that's another Disney property. So that's a good argument for them that they can repackage that IP over and over again for different audiences. And all of those, those Disney villains, and those, that, that's, that's very old stuff. 
it's all yeah. the very classic ones from back in the kind of golden age. They're kids. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point, Ari. Like they don't have to pay Tom Cruise hundred million dollars to do Top Gun too, right? Like they they own the IP and and you know the characters aren't aren't as expensive. I I did hear um uh, s- someone from I think it was a, a Hollywood producer who said that one of the concerns that they felt about their uh, the movies uh, was that they were not as captivating as back in the olden day because they didn't have the big screen, and so that type of I don't know what the right word is like really like part, partly there's a lot more noise out there. I guess that that's that's part of it. But like it's it's harder to build that franchise today because of that, but also because you don't get the si- same type of wow experience because so much is now produced for the streaming services. They're not produced for the big screen. Um so anyways. Um Any any thoughts on the valuation, Toby? I I I want to know. I, my range is just crazy whenever it comes to comes comes to Disney. Yeah. It's a it's it's a hard one to figure out. There could be a lot of value there. It could be, who knows? It really depends on how you look at it. I was interested in what you thought. Actually, <laughs> so I, I've got the same I've got the same issue. I, I get a very low valuation based on the historical on the trailing. So, um, it's probably. I mean, I'm interested to to hear what. Uh, what Harry thinks about the sort of returns from here, likely returns. No, I think um, I was actually hoping you guys will comment on the valuation. <laughs> <laughs> I was only focusing on the competitive advantage, but I mean, uh, on the valuation piece, my main thesis is that the PE is high today, but um the denominator, the earnings will keep going up. Um, right now, they don't have to do much in terms of growing the revenue, and that's the that's the sweet spot they are in. They, they, I think, have distracted themselves. Personally, I feel ESPN is a distraction. It doesn't add value to their franchisee. It is just kind of an empire building exercise that happen that happens in many companies. And if they can get rid of such non-value accretive franchises or uh, assets, uh, not only will they improve their balance sheet, but they'll also improve their earnings. That, to me, will be a catalyst. So um, in that sense, I feel right now they're at least, they can improve their earnings by 30 40% over a period of three to five years. And relatively, the stock price will also improve. So that's that's my kind of back of the envelope math, if you will. Um, I would say, um, I would agree with Stig that when it approaches 100, it is really attractive. Um, but I think anywhere between my fair value comes around 150 to 170, depending on how you look at it. See, I see I got a 3, 3% free cash flow yield in a market where the 10 year is over four and a half and probably going higher from here. So that says to me that the free cash flow yield has to come up quite a lot before, you know, I don't know how much growth you'll, you you can rely. I mean, it's been. I, I sort of I feel like the the number for me, and admit it, I'm a very conservative, deep value investor. So Disney's sort of not really in my area of strength. So for me, it looks expensive, and I would I would say even a hundred is expensive for me. Like I would want it down in the honestly somewhere between fifteen and thirty dollars is sort of my range to get a reasonable return out of it. That might be too harsh. Wow. Um, it's possible that they do some rationalizing, spin off some of the spin off ESPN, um, you know, right size Disney Plus. Maybe all of that changes the the uh, the valuation. But I, you know, it's uh, yeah, I think it has the core of a very good business there. I also think the market is a little bit uh, over its skis for 
you know, if you're looking at a long, a long enough period of time where the valuation starts to matter, I would be much more comfortable of quite a bit lower than here. I, I don't mean to be too aggressive on that, Harry, because I do like Disney and I like you too. It's not, it's nothing personal. It's just, that's my bias. I just, I prefer stuff to be closer to fair value. So you said, I just want to make sure, Toby, you said 15 to 30. And then Hardy, you said 150 to 170? Something like that. <laughs> is, is, is that sort of like- I mean, we're talking about a wide range here. Like we, we are talking about a very wide range, but this is a 3% free cash flow yield in a market where, you know, you can get risk-free pretty good rates. And I, my bias is probably that that risk-free rate is going higher still. You know, in a market where you get to 6% on the 10-year, which is the long run tr trend, the very long run trend, and who knows if we get there or not, but- that is the long run trend. You know, a 3% free cash flow yield for Disney, admittedly a growing 3% free cash flow yield. Like where should that trade? Quite a bit lower to get to, you know, to de-risk it and get to, to get down there. I think the, I think there's been a little bit of a um, regime change in the market where previously really high rates of growth, really good IP, protect, uh, competitive position and so on, that, that was probably more important than valuation. And I think that was from like 2015 to 2022 or 2021. I think that the market is changing a little bit right here. And uh, it's going to be more of a, you know, show me kind of market for a while at least. I think that's a fair point, Toby. I think especially considering the risk free rate today and for the foreseeable future, it becomes really hard to justify a 3% um, free, free cash flow yield. I, in, in that sense, I feel from a timing perspective, this might not be a great timing. Uh, I, see, I see Disney more as a long-term bet that I can buy at a price that is not uh, exorbitant, where I can park my fund safely for some decent returns over a long period of time. But um, is this price the right price? I think I'm also not very sure. So I would I would be more comfortable when it gets below 100 for sure. So uh, I know it's I know the easy solution for me to be like, oh, somewhere between 15 and, and 170. I, I can, <laughs> I want to be a bit more specific than that. Um, I said 100 before. Uh, I do think that the intrinsic value is lower than 100. Um, so, so how do we how do we square that circle? Partly is that when I, whenever I originally made that um, made evaluation of Disney, uh, the interest rate was very different. So we also also have to remember that. So to, to Toby's point before about what's what's the 10 year, and as we all remember, not too long ago the 10 year was almost uh, non existing at all. I guess uh, another another reason is that um, I I think. I th I see, I see the competition differently now in the in streaming services. And it is sort of like, how much is something worse that, that's uh, losing a billion dollars a quarter? Like we can, we can probably do an entire series on how, how to value that. But of course it has, it has some value. Um, but if you look at it, like the, the really attractive thing here would be the, uh, like park experience and products. And just, I know we can, we can take that, uh, that, um, income segment uh you know a long way back but we're around like seven eight billion then then you have you know what's a cable broadcast let's call it eight billion ish like that's a dying segment it's 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 slow and steady but it is it is you know in the wrong direction and of course you can you can also make the argument you know that it does create some barriers to entry to some extent uh because it's not it's not a it's not a market a lot of uh competitors want to enter because it is declining but then you also have to remember that there are a lot of different things today that can substitute uh, cable and broadcast channels. So um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm definitely below 100 today on the intrinsic value because of of, of those those reasons. Um, so the thing about Disney, though, yeah. the thing that it does have, I, and I think we alluded to this at the start, was that there is this transition from the pipes to the content creators, and it, it, that has always been the that, you know, you can go back and look at broadcast TV, cable, and so on. There has always been an initial value bump to the to the pipes, but it has always the value has always trended back to the content creators. So it's good to be a content creator. Um, 
and they have these two machines. They've got Disney Animation and Pixar, both of which are very good, and Marvel now. Like all of those are really great content IP libraries and content creators. Like that's that is where I see all of the value in this thing. And and the parks, the parks is a way of monetizing that, and all of the Disney stores is a way of further monetizing that. I think their problems are the streaming, but you you, you point out that that's a way of generating analytics. It's four billion dollars a year in analytics. Could you get that cheaper? I don't know. Maybe somewhere else. ESPN, that's a tough asset because it's there's so many places to get your sport now, and ESPN sort of become a political. Uh, they've they've taken a political view on a lot of the things. It's turned off half of the population already in a market where the the bundle's going away, and so you have to pay. You have to like actively seek it out and pay for it. And there are other options. But, you know, there's still the core of this amazing IP there that is valuable. And I I would want it de-risked a lot before I would want to have a look at something like that. But I can see, you know, Disney's not going away. Disney's not a donut. So there's a, there's a lot going for it. It's got, it's, you really have to do a lot to hurt that franchise. But sometimes it feels like they are doing a lot to hurt that franchise, honestly. Yes, they are. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I don't know, like, uh, to your point, Tobin, we all, you know, being students of, of Buffett and talks about that replacement cost of, of Disney, like that would be humongous, right? Even for this company with an EV of 250 plus billion, it's, um, it's tough. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm sure that there are extra amounts to, to grow, but I, I just want to, I came up with this interesting stat here because uh, today, whenever you include Hulu and ESPN, they're the biggest in the world and, uh, and uh, Netflix is number two. They have, uh, what do we have? They have a bit more than 200 million uh, subscribers. Um, 61 million of them are in India. The main reason why they do that is for cricket and it's 58 cents a month. Um, so I just, I just think it's important whenever you, you 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 look at those numbers like some of those are are vanity metrics to to some extent plenty of pricing power there plenty of just keep on lifting plenty that margin power. yes <laughs> um, i saw a statistic that of the dollars every dollar spent in cricket globally something like 89 cents of it comes from india yeah i i can imagine that <laughs> it's practically a religion in india um all right. Um, you know, uh, anything more here to to Disney before we uh, before we move on? No, I think this was really good insights. Thank you. I think uh, um, some of the facts that you brought up actually does make sense to me, and I will go back and revise my fair value based on some of the points that you brought up, uh, Toby and Stick. So thank you. That was very helpful. Um. Well, thank you for for saying so, and 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 Hari, please make sure to push back whenever you hear my pick, because um, my pick uh, is facing a lot of the same competitors. So you can you can just throw it back into my back in my face afterwards. But I don't, know, Toby, would it be okay if I go next? Yeah, it's please, please. Somewhat, I don't know if it's uh, how much related it is, but thank you. Thank mine you, will Toby. be very short and sweet, so but you can stick mine at the end. So so, um, gents, uh, my pick is uh, is Spotify. And it's not the first time that I uh, have pitched that here to the group. I bought it originally back in June 2020 and uh, sold it uh, 318 January 2021. And you know, this is my this is my humble brag. This is actually not so much a humble brag. It was an analyzed return of 170 dollars. And what happened now is that I just bought it at 78. Whenever it buttoned out, ah, close to buttoned out in December, and it's trading 123 at the time of, of recording. So let's call it 57% return in two months, but who, who's counting, right? Um, <laughs> no, well this done. is not- Well this done, is... congrats. <laughs> hey, Jens, this is just because I'm usually wrong in my picks. So uh, whenever, you know, it's the broken, uh, broken clock theory, whenever it happens that I'm, that I'm right twice a day, um, <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to bring it up. Um, but guys, um, let me, let me, let me give you the, the pick here of, uh, the pitch of, 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 uh, Spotify. Uh, the business model is somewhat simple. It's a service where you can stream 
uh, music, you can listen to podcasts, and more recently, you can also buy audiobooks. They have two tiers, uh, a premium subscription with no ads and access to all the features, and then a free version with ads, and you like some of the features. And the main purpose of the free tier is to convert to, uh, users to being paid users. Um, if, you, if you read the financial statements, um, you can see that uh, all the money uh, is being made by premium subscribers, and it looks like the ad-supported uh, gross margin is just around 5%, so it, it, it looks like it's barely breaking even, and that's, that's true, but also they put a lot of the cost, a lot of the content creation uh, in that segment too, so it's just something to, to, to consider. Um, Spotify was founded in Stockholm, Sweden. It's technically registered in Luxembourg today. Uh, due to tax reasons. It was founded in 2006 and was the first company to bring streamed music to the masses. Um, as some of the listeners might remember, this was at the time where iTunes ruled the world. Uh, they had access to uh, 800 million credit card details at the time. Steve Jobs has publicly said that no one, no one wanted to rent music. So he had like a really hard time seeing how you could disrupt iTunes. I kind of feel I want to give him a pass on that one because he's been right on, on so many other things, but it does show you how how brutal uh, capitalism is. Um, with 30% market share, Spotify is by a large margin uh, the biggest streaming, um, the biggest music streaming service in the world. Um, and whenever Spotify launched, uh, they were really at the mercy of the major labels. And whenever I, I read uh, to labels, so EMI, Sony Music, uh, Universal, uh, Warner Music Group, together they have more than 85% of the market share. Yeah. And so um, so what you see now after Spotify uh, have made agreements with all of these um, uh, labels, what you see now is that a lot of the, the, the smaller competitors, I'm not just talking about the main competitors like uh, YouTube Music and uh, Apple Music and whatnot, uh, they're using, to some extent, uh, the type of contracts that were pioneered uh, back then by Spotify. Um, so Spotify, for obvious reasons, knew from the very beginning that they needed to, to limit the influence of, of the labels. Uh, the labels really pushed hard against free music. Uh, this was at the time of, of Naspers and Pirate Bay and all of that. And so it, it, like today, it seems like an obvious thing to go to Spotify and whatnot, but it, that was not the case at all back then. And one of the things that they had to do to get them on board was to give them equity um, at the time. And you might be saying that sounds completely counterintuitive. How can you say that's part of independence if they give equity to the to the labels? Well, as it turned out, um, some of those, uh, a, a lot of that was sold back during the IPO in 2018. But also, they made agreements where the co-founders Daniel Egg and Mark Lawrenson uh, got the the voting rights, uh, even though they did. Uh, um, so it's sort of like it's more like European system, but you can more or less compare it to AMB shares in the states. It's not completely the same that happened here, but they still remain in control today even though they do not have a majority of the, the equity. Um, so music streaming is just a tough business. It's, a, it's an absolutely terrible business. I want to say it might be marginal better than streaming, but um, you know, I, I, can, I can completely agree. Uh, I, I, I completely sympathize with, with Hari if he wants to to uh, bring up the bats whenever I talk about music streaming. Um, the gross margins are in the 25% range. If you look at this for, for Spotify, a, a, a bit higher. Um, it, it, they, they, it probably will be a bit higher uh, as we go along for, for different reasons. Um, at, perhaps we can get to later. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why um, uh, they're going to podcasting. So um, I can... I, I want to point out the uh, the irony of uh, of that because the 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 business case for going into podcasting is that partly they're independent from the labels, but also because they're um, they're lowering the production cost per listener. But then you can make the same argument for streaming services, and I just you know uh, <laughs> I just bash that. Uh, but you do have better margins with podcasts than music. Uh, you can't really scale. Um, you can't really scale music in terms of uh, ex expanding margins. Um, Spotify would more or less have the same margins with music um, if they were half or twice as big. And if you look into how Spotify uh, calculate the cost of goods sold in financial reporting, it all looks like a, like a big mess. Um, the, the way to really understand that is um, just going to shamelessly promote uh, this book. I think that's it's one of the good sources to, to understand. Oh, I, 
for those of who actually, it doesn't really make sense. I just put this up to the camera whenever this is a, this is a podcast. It's called Spotify Play. So you can sort of like back engineer some of those things. Um, or sorry, you can sort of like reverse engineer some of those things uh, of how they're constructed, but they probably won't be getting much higher gross margins, probably a few percentage points higher than what they do today. But it's, it's not going to be like, oh, we're just going to scale and then we're going to have you know half the cost or anything like that. That's just not how, how those contracts uh, work. Um, of course, for podcasts, which is the second business, uh, second biggest business unit, and perhaps in time could be could be the biggest. Who knows? Um, they are betting really, really hard on that. Uh, even so much that Daniel Ek, uh, the, the CEO, has said that he probably got carried away in 2022. Um, but they have their premium content that's only available for for paid subscribers. Uh, some of the some of the acquisitions have been quite good in the podcasting space. There also been a few dots in between. That's that's how it goes. Um, and so uh, what I want to highlight is that in 2018, uh, Spotify came out basically from nothing and said, we're going to be the biggest in podcasting. And at the time, you know, there were only Apple podcasts and more or less no one else. There were, there were, there were other uh, platforms, but no one anywhere near uh, Apple podcast. And, uh, you know, you also had Apple podcast, uh, you know, pre-installed in life. On, on, on iPhones, you know, there, there are so many things where you could say, how can Spotify ever compete with, uh, with Apple Podcasts? And here we are, you know, uh, they're bigger than Apple Podcasts in a bit more than four years. It's just amazing what they have achieved. Um, as someone who is an insider uh, in the podcasting space, I can say that they're both the best studios. They have the best companies in the podcast ecosystem. They're just miles ahead of everyone else whenever it comes to advertising, attribution. And I can say that because I've used their, their paid tools uh, for years on a daily basis. Um, uh, and I, I speak with them on a regular basis. Like they, they know what they're doing. And let me just give you an anecdotal example. So we have three shows here in the feed you're listening to right now. So we have We Study Billionaires, the one you're listening to right now. We have uh, President's Bitcoin Show and we have Williams, which is a wise and happier show. So if you listen to this on Spotify, you can see that. You can see the artwork change. Apple Podcasts have said the past two years that they're going to get right to it, and it hasn't happened. Like everything but Apple Podcasts is just like a just like a black box. They still have the auto download function, which is just like a no one advertises just hate it. And you know, Spotify is just they got to figure it out. So. Um, if I had to sum it up, I would say that Spotify is best positioned uh, in in this space. Um, so let's uh, let's transition to talking about competitive advantage and competitors. So whenever I look at um, Spotify's competitors, uh, they're the main they're mainly competing with Apple Music, Amazon Music, and YouTube Music, in that order. Uh, Spotify's market share is uh, just above thirty percent. Apple Music thirteen. Tencent, they're not really competing with, with, with Tencent. Um, actually, they also own share in each other's companies, which is sort of like a different story, but that's a 13 too. And then they have Amazon Music, that's 13, and YouTube, that's 9%. So um, this might sound a bit counterintuitive whenever I say that they have this huge advantage that they're an audio platform first, because then you could say, what about Netflix? You just talked about how uh, you know, Netflix do not have the same uh, benefits as as Disney, even though they're just focused on one thing. And I kind of like wanted to make a discrepancy there. So, um, you might you might be thinking that um, Spotify is at a disadvantage, for example, compared to to Apple Music, because Apple Music, since it's pre-installed um, on their app, um, you know that. Spotify is basically depending on you know, Apple as a toll bridge. And I, I wanted to, to talk a bit more about that whenever it comes to risk, because it, be, it might be slightly different. But in short, they're, they're created for all platforms, as opposed to, for example, something that's on iOS or Android. Uh, but let me give you an example of not being an audio platform, uh, audio first platform. So Google has gone back and forth on whether they wanted to display a play button in the browser for whenever you search for a podcast. And you might be thinking, well, you know, Google, they own YouTube music, so that's an advantage. But the thing is that audio is just such a low priority for Alphabet or for Google that uh, now they, 
they removed it. Like they have so many other priorities that the way that Google, because you know, that's where they make all the money, the way that works together with podcast isn't efficient at all because it's not about audio. And so, you know, whenever you, whenever you go through also the, the earnings calls, like for, for obvious reasons, um, it's just clear whenever you listen to what Daniel Ek is uh, saying in the, uh, in the transcripts uh, that it's driven all by audio. And you don't hear any of that whenever you, you go through what Alphabet are doing, um, Apple, uh, and, 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 uh, and Amazon, which again, it's also, it's also Amazon's value proposition is slightly different because it's part of, of uh, Amazon Prime. Um, so I wanted also to, to have, I have a section about risk I also wanted to talk to you about, but I also want to start a different place. Um, do you know the person who doing a job interview says something ridiculous like the biggest weakness is that he works too hard? You know, <laughs> that, that kind of ridiculous <laughs> response. So Care too much. Care yeah. too much, yeah. stuff like that. So with that in mind, and the irony of me saying that, uh, let me go to, to this point about risk. So I also want to say that there is an opportunity with the risk that Spotify has because they are competing with, uh, with, uh, with Google and they're competing with Apple. And you need those devices to access Spotify. Of course, you can also go to your laptop and, I don't know, go to Firefox and what, like, you know what I mean? Like, in effect, that's not how you, how you, how you use uh, Spotify today. And there is a lot to be said about the whole thing about, uh, you know, the, the Apple tax and, and how that's, you know, being, being uh, right now um, have this case in the European Union, or sorry, the European Commission and all of that. But basically, I see it as a problem, but I probably also see it as an opportunity in the sense that as anyone with an iPhone knows, they are selling Apple Music hard. And despite that, Spotify is still more than twice as big as uh, Apple Music. And also, Apple Music requires for you to use an iPhone. And so what has happened with Spotify is that from the very beginning, they lived on all platforms, not just smartphones, because is obviously the, 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 um, the biggest medium, but they lived on all uh, platforms or mediums because... They had to do that. That was just ingrained in them. You can say same thing. Same. You can you have the same criticism about the whole Android um, system or the e ecosystem, if you if you want. Um. So it might sound ironic, but to me, that's not right now what I'm mainly concerned about. Of course, this is in tech. This is like a you know sexy field. There you have a lot of interests that want to go into this field, which you just know by definition, you don't want to enter into a field like that. But I guess that the elephant in the room is not so much the competition from Apple Podcast and from YouTube Music. I also, uh, like I mentioned before, I don't, I think Amazon Prime and, and what they do through Amazon, uh, Amazon Music is, is interesting. They, they bought Wondery, which is one of the better podcasting uh, studios, but they have a different strategy. It's a strategy of making sure that people stick with, with Amazon Prime. Um, they're doing a great job. They're doing great things in advertising, but I do not consider them the, uh, the main competitor. One thing I would like to, to highlight that sort of like have come in from, from a field here uh, a few years ago has been TikTok. That's, you know, we have all of these rumors about how they are going to start signing their own artists and how that's going to disrupt the entire music industry. Um, you also like, and they're also the target group. What's, what's the, where do you have the most, the biggest discrepancy between the overall public and what Gen Z is like? That's TikTok. Uh, Spotify is number six on that list, by the way. And so uh, to me, that's a, that's a big risk that some people, but not a lot of people talk about. It's, it's someone who has, depending on how you measured it, close to no market share, but could get a huge market share uh, very, very soon. Um, and then I have a I have a segment about about valuation, um, but I kind of feel I've been I've kind of feel it's been a long pizza already. So I want to sort of like open up and then perhaps uh, for any questions, any thoughts, and then perhaps we can uh, together walk walk through a valuation. I think Spotify is an interesting pick because it's the opposite of uh, of Harry's pick. So Harry had the content, you got the pipe, and. Um, 
Spotify, I think, is one of those really interesting business success stories for those reasons that you outlined, that they're really in hostile territory on an iPhone where they're pushing iTunes hard. iTunes had a huge lead. They had to overcome that. And they've managed to do that. So, you know, hats off to Dan Eck and whoever else is in there who's responsible for that. The the issue, I mean, I, the the... The issue that I see is the one that I sort of articulated in relation to Disney in the sense that it tends to be this drift from value for the pipe to value for the content producer. And the content producer in this part is the musicians and the podcasters. And um, to Spotify's, um, you know, Spotify's sought to overcome that issue by getting exclusive access to certain podcasts. Probably the most famous one is Rogan, who they paid him $100 million. But again, Rogan's political and um, polarizing and that that potentially alienates half your half your audience and also potentially some of your you know there was a, a lot of the musicians asked for their music to be taken off spotify because um they didn't want to be associated with rogan and so on the the issue that i see is going to be one of valuation uh, naturally because <laughs> that's that's who i am but when i look at it it's a 29 billion dollar market cap it's got some debt in there as well. And it's got $12 billion in revenue. Admittedly, revenue is growing pretty quickly. None of that revenue is falling through to the bottom line at present because they're spending so much. I just wonder, at what point does it reach scale? Does that competition from iTunes ever go away? When they do, how much of it falls to the bottom line? And so as an investor, you know, what do you actually end up owning? Because do you see the competition going away at any point? Because I don't think that, I don't see how that happens because it's it's iTunes and Apple are always going to be there because that's the dominant device that people listen to it on. Although I've downloaded it onto my television. I have Spotify so I can watch the the podcasts on, on Spotify, mostly Rogan's, so I can watch it on, on, on the TV. But I find it, um, I sort of think this is at two times revs with nothing falling through to the bottom line, what, like at what level is scale? So, uh, great questions. Um, let me let me uh, start with the with the thing you said about Rogan. Not to not to be uh, political in any kind of way. What was interesting was that the artist came back. Um, like there was a huge discussion about all of that, and then Neil Young and a few others, and there's they were said, "No, we don't want to do it." And then they came back, and one of the reasons is just that. The, the tables have turned whenever it comes to um, to the music industry. It used to be so that Spotify needed the labels. Now the labels need Spotify, which is interesting in itself. Um, to your question uh, about when it, when do they reach scale, um, I think if if you ask Daniel Ek, uh, the CEO and co-founder, uh, he would probably say never. <laughs> he's uh, he's. Uh, <laughs> He's a very interesting person. It's it's, it's very, very of him. <laughs> it it's very interesting to go through uh, his interviews, um, and he's clearly been inspired by Jeff Bezos. And and I, I know this is going to come off as ridiculous when, when I'm saying this, being being a value investor um, and being wanting to ha- to have a very conservative valuations because there is an element of of faith in this. Uh, because whenever whenever he talks about you know in 2030 the goal is 100 uh, sorry the the goal is um, uh, 1 billion users they are at 489 million right now and he talks about making 100 uh, euros uh, per person that that's or, or or per user that that sounds pretty ridiculous to me it sounds highly ambitious and at that time he he thinks that they will have 4% uh, gross margin uh, and and right, I think right now it had only twenty five, twenty six, and it talks about operating margin of twenty percent at that time, which is right now close to close to non non existing. And so, you might be thinking, um, is that possible? How how are you going to see that margin expansion? One of the one of the ways is that more revenue will come through non music uh, type of of, of revenue, uh, and they. They want to set up different type of verticals. So the first one for uh, was was podcasting. Then they have audiobooks that they just came, uh, send out. Now last quarter they had um, uh, five hundred million uh, bought audiobooks, which giving uh, in the, in a quarter given that it's just launched, it was I was quite impressed by. 
Uh, and who knows what the next vertical uh, could be? But and we can co- come back to one of what uh, those verticals could be uh, afterwards. But just just talking about hitting hitting scale, um, I think it's also important to look at whenever you look at, for example, the free cash flow, which, which has been more than two hundred million dollars over the past three years. You have a lot of growth capex in that, and they talk a lot about. It's not about short-term profit. It's about, uh, <laughs> to use your word, like, uh, so it's like hit, hit scale, get the users in, and then start to to monetize them. Uh, so they are profitable. Uh, they, they have a few billion dollars. I, th- I, ha- I think I have a, just around $3 billion in, in net cash. So that's not one of the... Uh, because the, the that, so that's, that's netted out from the debt? Yes. So, uh, so they are... Uh, Cash positive. Uh, they also have a, a net, um, oh, sorry, a negative networking capital. One of the, w- there were some contracts that were leaked uh, from back in the day. And I can't say if it's because th- these contracts are being renegotiated, but they get the money up front and then it takes four to five days before they have to pay the labels. Again, now we're talking about music. And that is traditionally how they made, made money. And so if we say that they're going to do between 25 and 30 and gross margins, um, of course, to get to 40, they have to do a lot of other things that are not music, which is where they've, where they've shown that they're successful. But I also think it's important whenever you talk about podcasting, not to be too f- fixated on um, on the, the exclusive shows. I think, you know, when, whenever you hear about some of the, the beta studios and they're the exclusive for, for Spotify, I think you have to consider uh, that the ecosystem that Spotify is built uh, up around. And so... Uh, we talked with Spotify, just the MSS Podcast Network, not too long ago, about hosting on that their platform instead of another platform, and uh, and they make money based on that. Uh, they also they also make money based on how they they sell advertising. So you cannot buy, you can't go to Joe Rogan's show now and say I want to buy ads on your show. What they're doing is they're packaging and they're saying, okay, uh, mail between eighteen and thirty four, yada yada yada. So like. That's the way that that uh, that they sell that. So they have very personalized ads for everyone who are hosting on the platform, and they also bought Anchor. Um, this is where new podcasts today start. It wasn't in the past, but they bought that. They have pod sites, Chartable. That's how you do attribution, and they have Megaphone. This is the leading hosting platform. We don't use it for different <laughs> different reason, but like I can see what what they do. It's also because it's just a pain to <laughs> to move hosting and all that, but like. They buy the best assets. You can just see how much they understand the podcasting space, and it's very interesting to see also now how they include uh, audiobooks in their app, and how how the their the, their the, their competitors are not doing that because they're not audio first. And so I kind of feel like I'm selling them a bit too hard. Um, <laughs> um, if you if you believe in Daniel X uh, projections, which you probably shouldn't. You won't last long in this game if you if you if you think that what management thing is going to happen in seven years. There's a hundred percent probability in that happening. Um, but you know you will have returned thirty plus percent a year next seven years. I don't necessarily no. I don't think that's going to be the case. But I end up with a valuation uh, around two hundred dollars ish today. And you might be then be thinking, well, it's like you said before, like you sold at 318. That was like it huge overvalued before you managed to sell it. Uh, of course, there also capital gains tax and different things to consider. But also remember, again, that the interest rate was very different back then. So given the interest rate that we have now, that's probably where I am. Uh, but again, um, <laughs> like we talked about today, it's, you know, all models are great if you have the right inputs. Um, so... Uh, Hari, let me let me throw it over to you. No, I think this is very interesting pick. Uh, Stig. And personally, I'm a fan of Spotify. It's almost like the Google for podcasting. Like many people use it, and it's almost synonymous with podcasting. Uh, where I see uh, risks are in the long term. For this, it's it's almost like a toll bridge on a toll bridge. Like it's it's kind of in the Facebook realm in the sense they're dependent on or at the mercy of Apple and Google. But however, I feel um, probably they're not as uh, risky as Facebook in that sense uh, that Apple would do something to them. 
but where i am really concerned is the two things that uh, we discussed during disney is one is they are a pure content aggregator so their cost of content will keep going up over a period of time the loyalty of the listeners is to the content creator not to the channel so if joe rogan or stig you decide to move out of spotify and go on youtube only i will listen to you on youtube uh so they can because the cost of switching is easy there's not much uh i think this makes it um bit risky for me in the long run because we don't know uh because they might the the content creators might have more leverage on them than they having leverage over the content creators you know i i i, I wish that was i wish that was true hari and um because I, I thought about it <laughs> as, as a content creator, what would we do if, because uh, if you're listening to this on Spotify right now and you will, you're here ads that you're probably going to skip, but if you are listening to this on Spotify right now, these are agreements that we made with our sales team made with advertisers that are running from our uh, feed that's hosted on a platform in, in our case called Art19. And so um, Spotify does not make any money of that. Spotify could say to us, we're not going to pick up your feed unless you pay us. That would be really tricky for me to say no to. I would be willing, I hope they're not listening to this, but I'll be willing to pay a good price for us to continue to send that out to all our listeners on Spotify. Because Spotify, what they want is that you host on that platform called Megaphone. And if you do that, then they can sell the advertising. And if you have exclusive content, you can sell that on Spotify. And they take, uh, I want to say right now it's 15% the first year and then it's 30% afterwards. But anyways, and so, so they have a lot of, of power right now around the, uh, the, the system. So I, I want to highlight that. And uh, I also want to highlight um, that being on the app um, is very difficult. Like... Th- so let, let me let me go about that a different way. Being on the app is very powerful because they control the discover function. So they can say, you listen to We Stay Billionaires, great. Why don't you also listen to Startup, like one of the bigger business shows, which is their show. And so one of the things that independent publishers like us are afraid of is that all the different studios have teamed up with different type of uh, different apps and they promote their stuff. They're not promoting our stuff. So um, I hope you're right that that content creators have the bargaining power, Hari. Um, I don't think it's, it's as powerful as I, I would have loved it to, to be. Um, the, the other thing uh, is we had Brian Lawrence on the, on the podcast some time ago. And he, he, he had this quote. I can't remember which, which stock he was, uh, he was talking about. But I remember him saying that he really wanted to invest in companies where um, Google has tried to compete with them and fail. And I kind of like that way of thinking. Like, look at this company. They're, they're, they're first mover. They're dominant in the field. Uh, and uh, they're the biggest by a big margin. And they're competing against Google, Amazon, and Apple. Like there's, there's something there. There's something they can do. So it sort of like depends on, on, on how you look at it, of course, with that type of competition. Um, but I, I'll be the first one to, to acknowledge Hari also to, to what I said to, to you about, to about Disney. It's a, it's a tough business to be in. And the barrier of entry that they used to, used to be in the music space are not there anymore. Just, just the way that, um, um, the deals are being made with the labels today. It's much easier for new um, new entrants using the Spotify manual, if you want to, uh, to start licensing uh, that music. All right. Um, anything else here to uh, no? I think that, that was a, that was a good summary. Talk about Toby Speck. No, I think that was a good summary. Thank you, Steve. All right, thank, thank you, Hari. Uh, Toby? Thanks, Dick. Um, mine is Amgen. It's a old, old biotech, biotech pioneer. Started in about 1980. Um, it's 
trading today a little bit south of two hundred and forty dollars. It might be two hundred and thirty-eight or something like that. When I wrote it down, it was two hundred and forty. Market cap's about one hundred and thirty billion dollars to get to that level. Um, they've got about another, not quite thirty billion dollars in debt. So enterprise value altogether is about one hundred and fifty-eight billion dollars. Net debt of about twenty-nine billion, as I mentioned. And that's generating about $11.5 billion in free cash flow a year. So the free cash flow yield to the enterprise value is in the order of 7 plus percent. Um, so free cash flow yield on the, or the, the 10 years at four and a half. So it's very far north of that. The reason it's trading at a little discount that to, to um, well, that's a, that's a wide discount to the 10 year is clearly the market expects some material decline in revenues over the over the foreseeable future. Um, biotechs are not something that I would typically, I don't really like to pitch them as individual stocks. I tend to, um, I do buy them and I own Amgen in full disclosure. I own it in Zig and I own it in, I own it in Zig rather. And I don't know, you know, when I when I come to rebalance, it's entirely possible that these things get rebalanced in or out. I don't want to make it sound like I'm I'm entering into some sort of um, blood relationship with all of the other picks that I've had. I want to make it clear to everybody that my picks are largely um, quantitative. I like f- to look in the financial statements. I don't spend a lot of time looking at the business. It's mostly driven by the financial statements because I think that you get management's attitude to various things in the financial statements. And so I, I have a little bit of trouble often pitching biotechs because for the reason that Harry pointed out before, they've got kind of a limited period of time where they can earn all of the money from these drugs and then they become, they go off patent and the most successful ones get competed with very heavily. Having said that, when I say heavy competitions, you know, Charlie Munger talks about that like white glove gentlemanly kind of competition. And I think that that is really what prevails in um in biotech land because they never really, it's not that bare knuckle um, competition where they drive margins and profits to zero. They really do compete at a at a very genteel level and they all make pretty good returns on invested capital even after they've gone into off-patent um, off patent world. Uh, I can I can mention all of the drugs that, that these guys have, but There'll be somebody listening out there who knows this stuff really deeply. I, 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 it's difficult to, to understand what the what the universe looks like after all of these things come off patent. The, the problem for for um, for Amgen in particular, they've had this very successful drug, Enbrel, that will gradually the, the profit from that will gradually decline. They've made some acquisitions, and they produce things called biosimilars, which is like that's that's what competes with patents. So, They've got this leading Humira is the number one selling drug in the world, and Humira is just about to come off patent. And they have a biosimilar that's about five months ahead of everybody else. That will be probably the thing that will generate pretty good revenues and cash flow growth in the future. the The attraction that I have to Amgen is it's quantitatively cheap, and they have this exceptional buyback record. Since about two thousand and eighteen. They've retired about 26% of their shares outstanding, which I like buybacks for a number of reasons, particularly when they're done at undervaluation. Amgen's been a, something that I have owned on and off for a very long period of time in various different accounts and funds that I've managed because they've been such a consistently strong repurchaser of, of stock. Because when it gets cheap, they buy back stock and it never really gets too overvalued. They sort of tend to be quite good at buying back and then for all of the reasons that I articulated before about biotechs, they just never get particularly expensive. Although it did, if you look at the chart, you'll see that it ran up to 290 last year. It's come back to 240. So who knows what ha- – lots of loopy things happened over the last few years. That's just one of them. So they're likely to continue to buy back the stock. In addition to that buyback, they've got a 3.5% dividend yield, which is – or it's about 3.2% as of today. So they've got a very consistent record of paying dividends. They've, they've paid dividends. Um, they've raised the dividend consecutively for the last 11 years. The last five years, the compound annual growth rate in the dividend is about 11% a year. In addition to the buybacks, the, the shareholder yield is monstrous and it's driven by the fact that they've got a 
free cash flow yield of over 7%. So they've got plenty of headroom there. Their payout ratio is about 44%. That's not going away anytime soon. They had a slowdown in revenue last year. They had 2% growth in revenue to the last quarter. That was actually driven by there was a 9% increase in volume, which is pretty healthy. Um, but they had some Forex um, headwinds that reduced it by sort of 7%. So you can see that that might reverse at some point. The, the strong dollar hurts companies like like Amgen. Uh, I, um, I like it because... In, in very simple terms, it's priced as if the revenues will permanently decline from here. And um, they've been reasonably successful at making acquisitions and so on. And I think it's unlikely that revenues decline. I think it's much more likely that revenues grow, even if they just grow slowly from here, there's an enormous amount of headroom in this valuation. So they can make plenty of missteps and I still think it's undervalued. You combine that with the fact that they're very good at buying back stock and they've got that great dividend yield um, plus pretty consistent growth if you have a look at the stock chart like the stock has been in has been a very consistent returner for a very long period of time and it never gets too it never really falls out of bed because they're so good at buying back stock when it when it goes down they buy it they buy it i just think this is one of those opportunities where you can buy some reasonably cheaply i own it as for an in-depth discussion about the competitive dynamics of this market, I, I, I can't really help you and I don't think anybody else can either. I think it's a really, really tough um, industry to know, which is one of the reasons I don't particularly like pitching these names individually. I own it as part of a basket of 30 stocks, all of which have characteristics like this. And I expect over my portfolio of stocks that these will generate pretty good returns. But as for any individual stock, I don't really know which one it will be. I pitched this one today because this is a, from my perspective, this is a reasonably um, frothy market. And um, I think I've discussed this before on the last podcast that I saw that that 10 3 inversion has historically preceded recessions um, pretty consistently. It's never had a false positive. We've gone, we've, we've flipped negative now. Cam Harvey, who's the bloke who came up with that idea, has come out and faded it. He says, ignore my ignore my little indicator because there are all of these other things going on that mean that it's not it's not relevant this time. Cam Harvey said the same thing in 2008. He said, ignore it. It's likely to be a, a slower growth, not a recession. And as we all know, 2008 was one of the worst ones we've seen. So I think you can discount what he says a little bit, and I think you can pay a little bit more attention to the indicator, but he's by, far, by no means the only person who's saying it. There are lots of other people out there who say that the 10 is not relevant and it's not going to work this time. I don't have a view one way or the other. I just look at its track record and its track record is pretty good. I wouldn't trade on it in, on, in any way, shape or form. I just think it's worth considering, particularly given that S&P 500 forward earnings have now gone negative and it's coincided with this incredible spike in the market since about October. And that's totally common too to every other point in time when you go back and look at every other um, real nasty bear market has looked the same way where there was this about a year in there was this little recovery I've always said it in 2000, 2008 we almost rallied back to all time highs happened in 2000 well almost rallied back to two, all time highs before you really got the pain I think that 2023 is likely where we see an enormous amount of pain so I'm trying to pick things through here that I think are financially robust and will survive will do something about the fact that they might get even further undervalued and you know the 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 end consumer of these drugs doesn't really care what the rest of the economy is doing they're going to pay for this um, because they need these drugs to feel good and so on so i think this is a reasonably safe bet with reasonably um good to conservative returns regardless of what happens to the global macro picture and uh, and it's Amgen. That's my pick. Thanks, gents. Interesting pick, uh, Toby. I think when you are talking about um, their patent expiring and their revenue falling off, I feel like it's almost like debt ceiling, like for these pharma companies, right? Like every now and then, investors expect that their revenue will fall off, and then. Somehow they managed to come up with a few more drugs. Happens to Johnson and Johnson, and 
a lot of other companies that I've been following. But I, I like your basket approach for pharma, though, in the sense you don't have to really worry. All the cyclicalities is adjusted. And then you can just nicely and safely collect your dividends <laughs> because it's as a group, they'll be paying all this good dividends. So that that is definitely interesting. Uh, and also, I think you're 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 positioning it as a safe haven in a turbulent market when we expect that there can be further sell off. That is also valid. The only concern I would have is at P20, is it a safe haven? Um, because are they? It's almost like price, like a growth stock, at this point. Yeah, I ignore the. I, you know, my my favorite metrics are EBIT, EV, um, and I like. I look at return on invested capital, even though I think that, as I've sort of written about in the past, that's a highly mean reverting series, and you have to find some strong reason why that won't mean revert. Um, I think the the best metric aside from EV EBIT is EV free cash flow. Free cash flow is a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more management discretion in free cash flow than there is in EBIT. EBIT is sort of, I know that everybody says, you know, Buffett's got this quote out there where he says, you know, EBITDA or manga, EBITDA is like liar learnings. That's true, but you have to understand the perspective understand why they say that. They say that in relation to management teams telling you what the EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA numbers are, or in that was in the context of a leverage buyout boom where people were using EBITDA multiples for acquisitions and EBITDA doesn't help you pay down debt. Free cash flow helps you pay down debt. I do these calculations myself. I don't care what management's estimate for adjusted EBIT is. Like I, I couldn't tell you what it is for any of the companies that I look at. I don't I don't even, I don't care. I just don't look at it. This is my own calculation. I calculate, I, I actually calculate, it's called operating earnings. I calculate it from the top of the income statement down rather than reconstructing EBIT from the bottom of the income statement up because it's a little bit more, you know, you, it's hard to lie about revenues, although people do lie about revenues because there's net revenue and so on. That there, there are ways to lie about it, but for the most part, revenues are real. Everything else that falls under that has a little bit of discretion in it. I calculate it from the top down. It's not management's calculation is the point that I make. So I like EBIT. I also like free cash flow, but there's much more management discretion in what free cash flow is. They can make decisions about, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can play with free cash flow. Having said that, buybacks and dividends, you cannot lie about those. Those things actually happen. You can you can declare a buyback and not do it. That's a, that's a, lots of them do that. But, but that's why I don't look at management. What management says, again, I'm looking at what the management has done in relation to buybacks and their track record here is very, very good. So that 7% free cash flow yield is real. 3.5% dividend yield is real. And the 26% of the outstanding stock that they've bought back is real. So all of those things together, that tells me that the free cash flow is likely real because they're actually employing that. So buybacks, again, something it's a reasonably controversial topic. It has most management teams aren't very good at buying back stock or they're using it to mop up share issuance on the other side. There's a lot of share-based compensation. They buy back enough stock that the stock price doesn't move. Oh, sorry, the shares out doesn't move. So th this is an instance where shares out has come down materially. And so that's real. That's a real buyback. And that for me, that counts. So I agree with you that um, the PE might be sort of optically high, but there are lots of decisions that by the time you get to the bottom of the, the income statement, there are lots of decisions that go into how much they report. And when they get to this size, they've got an office of the chief financial officer. They are There's a lot of engineering in that, which is why I try to sort of ignore some of those metrics um, because it's, you know, Jack, Jack Welsh used to say to, you know, he had these things called acquisition uh, reserves and they just, he'd say, I, I need another penny because I'm going to hit that number, I need $20 million out of that acquisition reserve and, and his and they'd financially engineer it and they'd give it to him. So I, I, I don't necessarily look at the bottom line. I'm trying to look a little bit further up the income statement and I'm trying to look at the cash flow statement and I'm trying to look at shares out and, and actually making sure that what they, what they are sort of representing as happening is, is actually happening in the financial statements, which is why I'm more quantitative than... Um, then sort of, which is a big distinction between me and say Buffett and other guys like who are actual real investors who know how to analyze businesses and do that sort of stuff. I don't look at, um, 
you know, so Spotify for me is a difficult one because it's not mature enough for me to really do any financial analysis on. Amgen has been around for so long. It's a mature business. The risk is the decline. That's a real risk, but I think it's ameliorated by the fact that they've got plenty of money to play with. They will be generating money for a long time into the future. I think it's reasonably safe, about as safe as it gets. But as I say, I don't particularly like biotechs as part of a basket. I think they're fine. So, uh, Toby, I, I, I like this peg and, and the, the first one, the, the first thing I thought of whenever I saw it was, um, like, didn't we just do Colgate? Oh, wait, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is Amgen. Oh, this is different stock. Uh, no, sorry for, for people out there who's like, why is Dick talking about Colgate? Um, it was Toby's pick last time. It's a very Toby type of, of pick. You know, you, you look at the 10 year financials here and you just see, slow and steady wins the race uh revenue go up you see uh, dividends are hiked every year you see shares are being bought back all the like it's just it's a toby type of pick and remember the old fable right like slow and steady wins the race and so <laughs> i think it is important also to understand like who is pitching with stock and why are they doing that so Toby has a, a basket approach. Uh, I want to say 30-ish. Please correct me if I'm wrong. 30 in my large cap, yeah. 100 in my small cap. Yeah. And, um, and you have a, a huge part of your own net worth um, in, uh, in your funds, which, which uh, I think is admirable and, and the way to do it. Whenever I talk about a pick like uh, Spotify, I also talked about, uh, I think last time was Process I talked about, uh, they are in in Toby's words. He, last time he said, uh, "Racy stocks." So I'm, <laughs> I'm got to use that expression. I don't know if process is so racy. I think process is process is more, much more sort of special situation. Yes. If you understand, you can. I can. I can get there on process. Spotify is a different question, but I, I don't have. I'm not. I'm not anti Spotify. I'm just you know I have the, my own biases when it comes to these things. Yeah, and and I guess. Uh, and also to to your point, uh, and what we talked about before about wh where this coming from. You know, I, I own five stocks. I'm not as I'm not as smart as, as Toby to to own a lot of stocks. So I, I guess you could you can also say that well, I own two. I own two stocks. To be fair, <laughs> I own Zig and Deep, and and oh, they right. own they own everything. But the only things that I ever mention on the show are things that I do own in the funds. And having said that, there's always a possibility that I sell out in the next quarterly rebalance. So I should make that clear as well. The decision is sort of largely out of my hands. It's, I look at the entire universe, what looks cheap, what's, what, moves, what looks expensive. So things I've pitched a few things that I have then, you know, have had a little run and I've rolled out of pretty quickly. I know sometimes I feel like I should just make that clear to people that I, this could be rebalanced out of at the next rebalance date, which would be, uh, which is the, which is the sort of quarter end in March. Um, yeah. So, uh, but uh, Toby, I, I really like uh, I really like this pick, and I, I'm reading this book um, right now. It's called Competition: The Mystified. It's written oh, by yeah. uh, Bruce Greenwald. Uh, I, I would highly recommend that book. Um, but you know, so so what is typically taught at business schools is uh, something called Porter's Five Forces, and he's talking about the competitive situation and how you should look at it uh, as a business person, but you can also say. Um, as an investor, and even Buffett has talked about Porter's Five Forces um, in one of the uh, shareholders' meetings. Actually, well, to be fair, someone quoted Porter's Five Forces, then ran through it, and Buffett was like, "Yeah, I think I do. I think I think I'm doing that. I just didn't know it was called that." But <laughs> apparently, <laughs> it's been somewhat ordained by Buffett. And so, uh, those five forces—that's threat of substitutes, power of customers, power of suppliers, competition in the industry, and barriers of entry. And what Bruce Greenwald is saying, and for those of you who don't know uh, Bruce Greenwald, um, so he's he's teaching. Uh, I don't know if he's anymore. I think but he's retired. He's retired, he's right? Retired. Yeah, but yeah. he used to teach uh, Graham's old uh, course at Columbia University, uh, and uh, quite an icon in in uh, the niche of value investing. And so he's saying, no, hold of five forces. That's way that's way too complicated. It's only one, and the one thing to to think about that's barriers of entry, and he has these amazing case studies about barriers of entry. Um, and so uh, one of the things he's saying is that you can typically see that through um, uh, stable market share, 
and then a high consistent return on invested capital. And, um, and, and to your point before, Tobin, you talked about how, um, how people uh, in, in biotech and in, in, in pharmaceuticals, how they don't compete too much with each other. And they do that for good reason. I, I'm going to give you the very short version. You can, you can read the 387, whatever, page uh, version in competition, demystified. Uh, but it's, it's really about, it's, it's painful whenever you start competing on price and like everyone loses. Well, the customer wins, but the, you can sort of like do different things in terms of signal, signal uh, to, uh, to competitors that you don't want to go into a price war. And um, uh, which is, if you, if you pick up the phone and call your competitor, it's illegal. But if you signal it different ways, it's not illegal, but you can still make a lot of money with this irony of it all. But you, you, you can do different things. And so um, what's interesting in this industry, you have high barriers of entry. And you can typically also see that because you have high fixed costs. It's extremely expensive to be in, in, in this space, but also very low marginal costs. And so what these major companies do is that they, comp- they have different drugs and they don't want to step too much on each other's toes because then they know that they will start, the competitor will start stepping on your toes. And remember, a price competition is really painful if you're the bigger player. You might be thinking, I need to lower my prices because I'm the bigger player and I want to keep the entrant out. But think about it. If you have 90% of the market and you're lowering the prices, you are the one who are getting hurt the most. <laughs> so it's, um, and it, I kind of feel like I've, <laughs> I've, I've lost my train, uh, uh, train of thought here, but uh, this is a, a very interesting stock. I don't have a lot of, Things to say specifically about, about the stock, but I can say from a from a competition um, standpoint, whenever you look at the numbers, uh, they're they're absolutely beautiful with high barriers of entry. Um, and then if we can just, and this is just on, on a really note, just because when at the time of recording, like all the rates is about this new chatbot and you know what Google is doing and their Bard and all of that. So I just wanna, I just wanna now we're talking about barriers of entry. I just want to pull up a quote here from Charlie Munger from 2009. Google has a huge new mode. In fact, I've probably never seen such a wide mode. I just kind of feel how interesting that is in, in the discussion and what we're seeing right now when we talk about barriers of entry and look what's happening right now. I, I don't know. Harry knows a lot more about that and whether that's truly, you know, if Google still have the same barrier of entry, but it's just... Even the best barrier of entries, they are, they are, eventually they will be broken down one way or the other. I don't know if it's going to happen this time around with this chatbot. I don't know if it's going to happen in, uh, for, for Amgen, but it will eventually happen. I guess that's, that's what I'm trying to say here. Let me throw it back over to you, uh, Harry or, or Toby. It happens quite a lot in biotech because the, because the patent runs out. That's the that's my main objection to it. You know, you would never. I don't. I think it would be highly unlikely to see Buffett buying something like this. Like Buffett doesn't buy biotech. He doesn't really buy pharma. So I always feel very uncomfortable when I buy this. If the guy who really understands competition won't touch this stuff, what am I doing in it? And the way that I justify it is, it's a little bit of a basket, and it has quantitative features that attract me. But if I had one bullet, I wouldn't spend it on this thing. Well said, Harry. Yeah, I think. Uh... You brought up a good point about Munger saying that Google has the uh, deepest moat. Uh, he also bought into Alibaba, so I think, and that is also having its own trouble. Um, yeah. And that that goes to say that you know we all should be humble when somebody like Munger can get it wrong. Uh, regarding Chat GPT, though, I think it's it's phenomenal. If you haven't used it, I highly recommend. Um, Bing recently integrated ChatGPT into Bing, <clears throat> and this this goes to tell um, the the staying power that Microsoft has. I think they have been at at search. Uh, I was back working at Yahoo when they acquired the search division of uh, uh, Yahoo, and they have that capacity to suffer almost for. <laughs> for decades and and the other thing i was looking at was like if you look at decade after decade uh among the top 10 companies uh, from tech many came and go microsoft has always been there so i i would say we have to be careful betting against microsoft and and looking stronger than ever yeah and looking and and also the culture like you know microsoft culture has transformed i think 
that's Satya Nadella. I think Bomber was kind of driving it to the ground in a way. But Satya really rescued it. But I think Google is looking more like uh, the old player here uh, and not, you know, almost being forced to innovate in this case. So the, the optics is bad. And even when they did come out with the demo, I don't know who is their marketing team suggesting the names like Bard, like, you know, um, and also like, you know, the de- demo had some glitches in it and yeah. it, it it just shows that, you know, uh, they were not prepared. <laughs> the thing is that the question is sometimes not who has the better technology. It's, you know, Buffett's analysis is often at the consumer, at the person who actually consumes this product, how will they consume it? And I think about it too. Like I have heard that Bing delivers better search results than Google. And now with this integration of chat GDP, GPT, I was using it a little bit because I kind of, I, I think it's fun to chat to it. And people have come up with some great questions that you can really test the limits of it. But I went to use it this morning and it was over capacity and it wouldn't let me in. And when I go to search something, I just type it into the Chrome bar and I don't even think about it. Like I would have to add an extra step of going to Bing. I'm like, I, w- I am trying to do it because I want to, I like having a second competitor in there. I, I'm one of the guys who uses um, Lyft rather than Uber because I want, I want the competitor for Uber, but I, um, it's a kind of a hassle. And like, if I'm being honest, still most of my searches are going to be into the ones that I don't even think about are going to go into the Chrome search bar and I'm going to type that in and, and use that. It's hard to change behavior. It's really, really hard to change behavior. And I have Gmail powers the back end of my uh, business email. It's my private email. I use YouTube. I pay for YouTube. You know, Google has Google has one of the great moats that sits a little bit below the line of sight, which I think is one of the best kind of moats to have that people don't even know that it's there. Like there are lots of companies out there like that that you've never heard of them. They just do all of the back end of something, and they basically just put their price up a little bit every year and you pay it because it's a key part of some bigger thing and you don't even know that you're paying it. Like those those are the good businesses to have, but everybody else knows about them too. So they're never cheap. That's a very good point, uh, Toby. In fact, the power is in the distribution, not just in the technology. And in fact, it's almost like the role is reversed. If you go back to 2000 or 98, 99, Microsoft was in the position of Google and that's how they killed Netscape Navigator, right? Uh, because they could, Microsoft operating system was like Google Chrome, basically today. That you you would just use whatever the operating system gave you. But over a period of time, they lost the share of their distribution channel, basically. And that was what made Microsoft weak at that point of time, that they had this really bad phase in the late, uh, like, you know, late 90s, early 2000, like late 2000, sorry. So uh, the bomber years, basically. I think Google is at that cusp right now. They control the distribution channel, as you said. I think I totally agree with you that I would, it would take me a lot of effort to go to Bing and search, whereas here I'm just typing into the Chrome browser. As long as they own the browser, they get the, get my search. However, what has happened over a period of time is the searches that are really valuable, high returns in terms of um, pay-per-click are the ones that I'm searching for products or something like that. Nowadays, I directly go to Amazon to do that. Yeah. So what is happening is a lot of different competitors are taking away the sh- mind share of entry point or the distribution channel away from Google. And I think Microsoft is and definitely understands this. So they came up with this new Edge browser, which has ChatGPT integrated. And I have to still try it, but I, I heard that it can even write a letter for you right from the browser, um, all that stuff. So they, they're definitely trying hard. I can see that, that Satya and Microsoft team are definitely trying hard to chip And away. they're focused on it too. They've yeah. said that the search margins are huge and they're going to have a shot at them anyway. Yeah. Whether they will succeed or not, I think time will tell. But I guess the days of Google being complacent are over is what I would say. And that has been going on for a couple of years now. This is ChatGPT is one other blow at the uh, moat. But I think Amazon actually 
uh, it's not visible, but actually Amazon is the one who is taking away a lion's share of Google's search, sponsored search ad share because a lot of valuable search is now going to Amazon, not Google. The other, the other thing, the other point worth making is that the 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 way that these um, moats get crossed is not sort of a direct competitor. It's something that comes out of the blue in the same way that the browser sort of overcame Microsoft's desktop dominance. The next level is probably something I don't I don't know if it's the metaverse, but that idea is the kind of idea that it will be. It'll be something where. You know, somebody, I saw it was circulating around on Twitter yesterday. Somebody wrote this long, it, it came out in 1979. It's very old. And they said, you know, that, and that was back when people were having to talk to computers and you had to be, a, you had to be able to program in order to talk to a computer. And we've clearly come a long way where you don't have to be a programmer anymore to get it to do a lot of stuff, but it's, it's going to get to that point where it's just a conversation. And at that point, you're sort of in the metaverse where you say, this is what I need you to do. And the AI and the computer goes and does that. That would have sounded crazy five years ago. It doesn't sound so crazy now, even though I think that's an incredibly difficult computer. That's a processing logistical nightmare now. It's not anytime soon, but at some point in the future, you will just have a little wristwatch and say it to the ether and it'll go away and do it and it'll know what you're talking about. And at that point, is it Chrome? That seems unlikely, right? It's some, I don't know who it is. Maybe it's... Maybe it's Facebook. It's Meta. It's the metaverse. You know, it's it's it, it's crazy. Who knows what's going to happen? I I tried playing around with the uh, with the chat robot, uh, uh, GPT, and to me, it was more like just like playing around, just like just for fun. And I was looking at it probably because I'm super biased. I'm I invested in, in Alphabet a long time ago, uh, knowing that of course no one could break down this mode like Manga talked about, right? So I wasn't I wasn't too impressed. Other than it was it was fun to play around, and then speak to our our YouTube host Ronica, and she says, "Yeah, whenever we talk about a new uh, a new topic, I just ask uh, you know the chatbot to to write it for me, and then I just edit and like do my own thing. So it's mine, but you know that's where I start." And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> like yeah. I did not see that one coming at all." So I guess the jury is still out. What's going to happen? I understand it's quite useful for programming. Harry, you might know better, but people can ask it, like, how would you get this thing to do this? And its answers are instantaneous and exactly right with the little bit of code that you need. Like, that is incredibly powerful. Yeah, I played around, played around with it. I was fascinated. Like, it could just generate code. You tell it the problem and then let, let's say you say, write a uh, program in Python or Java to scrape the web and search for this content. And it will actually give you the code. Yeah. Or you say, write a story uh, for ba based on following characters or like animals. It will write you the story. But I think going back to um, the risk that Google has is just not about market share. What is not visible to most of us is these are really 10x engineers, really Uber engineers who are working on this, and there are only a few of them, if you think about it. And the risk for Google is losing those to OpenAI. Because in the Valley today, OpenAI is the Google of 2000. That is the cool new kid on the block. And Google is this old company, which is bureaucratic and big, right? So think about from an engineering talent perspective as well. Where would the top talent flow? And, and the recent layoff Google did might actually be an impetus or an opportunity for OpenAI to steal more engineers from Google. And Microsoft is bankrolling OpenAI. <laughs> so it's like they are on offensive. So it, it is going to be very interesting how this will play out. And, and, and I don't think the story is over yet it, in the sense I, I would not write off Google at this point of time. They have the kind of round one they have lost it is how I see it, but there are more rounds to go. Yeah, early, early days. Let's, uh, let's end on that note, uh, Jens. Uh, as always, thank you so much for making time to, uh, to come on the show and, and talk about chatbots, 
biotech, Disney, and whatnot. It's always a pleasure speaking with you two, uh, Jens. As always, I would like to give you an opportunity uh, to tell the audience where they can learn more about you. Uh, Toby? I um, manage a firm called Acquirers Funds. We have two ETFs, Zig, the Acquirers Fund, which is um, small, uh, sorry, mid-cap, large-cap, deep value in the US, and I have a small and micro fund called Deep. Um, I have a website, acquirersmultiple.com, where you can get free stock picks that are similar to the one that I did there, quantitatively generated. And I've written some books. Um, most recent one was Acquirers Multiple, which came out in 2017. I'm working on a new one right now. Chat GPT is writing it for me. <laughs> or it is as soon as I finish here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I always love coming on. Good seeing you too, Harry. Yeah, same here, uh, Toby and Steg. Um, anyone can find me on my blog, bitsbusiness.com. I hang out in Twitter. Hari Rama is my handle, H-A-R-I-R-A-M-A. Look forward to the conversations there as well. Uh, but this was fun hanging out with you guys. Thank you. It was fun, guys. And um, I hope that uh, the audience are going to want to hang out with us. I think we all plan on going to Omaha here in, in May. So if all yeah, starts, ali- starts align, uh, we're going we're gonna to put a link in the show notes. We're going to have some events there and people can come and talk about stock investing, whatever they want to talk about. So that should be, should be good fun. Um, Jens, uh, thank you again so much for your, your time. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in, uh, in Omaha soon. Thanks, fellas. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of We Study Billionaires. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you subscribe to our podcast feed using the link here on the screen. This will really help support the show so we can continue to provide this great content to you for free. We appreciate you being a listener and hope to see you again next time. So to your point, Hari, I like the valuation. I don't like the company. Spoken like a true value investor, I guess.